Hello to all of our Pleasant Green parishioners, to our listening audience. Um, We count this a blessing that we once again are before you to share out of our Faith Pathway Quarterly, our fall session, uh, to share the lesson for this Sunday, October the 23rd, 2022, Lesson 8 out of Unit 2, titled, Out of Slavery to Nationhood. And for this Sunday, our lesson's title is, We Want a Human King. We Want a Human King. Our devotional reading is the number 93 Psalm. Our background scriptures are 1 Samuel, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 9, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 26. And our printed passage is... 1 Samuel, the 8th chapter, verses 4 through 7, and then the 10th chapter of 1 Samuel, verses 17 through 24. Our key verse is 1 Samuel, the 10th chapter, verse 19, and it reads, You have now rejected your God who saved you out of all of your adversities and your tribulations. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. Our lesson's aims are Understand why the Israelites rejected God as their king and sought a human king whom they could see. Sense your selfishness in seeking a quick solution to life's problems instead of trusting God. Pray for God's help to trust God as your only true king and ruler. And our lesson has three parts to it. And the first part is association begets assimilation. And then our next two parts are biting the hand that feeds and looks are deceiving. So we have association begets assimilation, biting the hand that feeds, and then looks are deceiving. And the titles of the parts of our lesson, just the titles them by themselves are like volumes of wisdom and uh teaching, understanding, just in the entry into the different parts of our lesson. And so uh, we would like to open up, of course, with prayer first, uh, before we begin the indulgence into our lesson. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this occasion. Uh, This is another day, another time another opportunity that we are able to indulge ourselves into your word and to ask for your understanding and direction as to what you would have us to receive. And then, Father, we ask that you would compel us by your spirit and convict us uh, by your spirit that we would be the examples and the light Uh, of your word, that we would be action in practice and not just hearers of your word alone. 
And we ask it all in the name of Christ and for his sake. Amen. Our lesson begins with the part of association begets assimilation. And I think that um, it is definitely worth repeating some of the commentary out of the introduction. And uh, I'm going to begin the reading towards the latter part of the uh, introduction. I'll begin where it has in quotations. Association brings about a simulation, as the expression goes. Canaanite idolatry influenced Israel's attitudes and opinions. Living close to idolaters tempted Israel to imitate their neighbors' social and political practices. During Samuel's tenure as God's prophet and their judge, Israel asked for a human king like the other nations. It was a mistake that they would regret for centuries to come. And therefore, we enter into our first segment of our lesson. And uh, I think that even though we're speaking of a historical practice or incident uh, years, centuries ago, it still is applicable today. It still applies. And so when we look at uh, the first part of our lesson, and uh, these are verses 4 through 7, and it says, All of the elders of Israel gathered together and said to Samuel, They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said this, these things, give us a king to lead us, they displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen, to all that the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And so many times uh, we find through life, not just in the biblical setting here, uh, but uh, we find in life that a lot of our influences uh, a lot of the experiences we encounter, many times uh, a lot of the uh, examples, uh, whether they be uh, intimate examples, emotional, social, educational, political, a lot of the affiliation that we encounter has a spillover into our own consciousness and our own decision making uh, in association or in affiliation with uh, the surroundings, what we are exposed to. And many times, our exposure and our daily contact with elements that are outside of our spiritual, our religious, or even our parental training at home. Many times we find that those things 
that are not innate in our uh, most practical surroundings, our home and our church surroundings, that many times those things are opposite and abnormal to what we have been taught from home or in our religious settings. And because of the influence, whether it is destructive or whether it is corruptible or whether it is immoral, because there's a continuation of seeing it Uh, being practiced and seeing it and being exposed to it daily and week and months and years at a time, we, whether we acknowledge it or not or want to accept it or not or if we're in denial, we become somewhat co-products of the behavior and the social climate around us. And as a result of this, we many times make the wrong choices, choosing things based upon what we've become accustomed to, because this is what we see regularly. And because we become accustomed to it, because that, um, uh, we see others and they come across as appearing to be, well, it doesn't appear like it's hurting them. Well, it doesn't appear like that uh, they're suffering any immediate punishment from it. Well, it doesn't appear like uh, that um, they, they're they near the end or, or getting ready to be wiped out. And it looks like uh, they're, they have wealth. Uh, looks like that, you know, their their communities look fine. Uh, it looks like that their lifestyles are okay. I don't see them dropping dead. Uh, so uh, I don't know why it wouldn't work for us. Uh, I think sometimes our our training, I think sometimes that our standards, I think many times our morals are too strict. Uh, I think there's too much of a demand upon us. Uh, I think that uh, we're being asked to go above and beyond, that, that uh, this is too much of a, uh, the, the bar is set too high for us. Uh, there's being, we're being asked to do kind of like above what, what is humanly normal. And so, therefore, I think that maybe we should try to mimic or practice or copy what we see other nations do. Uh, they're not all bad. And this leads us into the association which begets assimilation. And one of the things that was cited in our commentary was that Samuel was told um, that he was aging and that... Um, a lot of times, uh, younger generations uh, look upon the elders and say, you all are out of touch. Um, you're not aware of where things are today. Uh, you're not up to date on it. Um, you don't understand. This is a new era. Uh, we are in to uh, uh, different uh, practices. Uh, We have new methods. We have uh, new ways of uh, reaching resolutions to different things. Your uh, practices and, and your traditions and your customs are old. They're outdated. Uh, They're not relevant anymore. And so as a result of that, they told Samuel that you're too old to lead us, and we're we're going in a in, in a new direction now. Uh, we have some some new paths uh, that we're going to take. 
uh, you haven't traveled along these roads, and uh, we need new leadership. We need someone that is going to take us um, into the future. Uh, well, we want someone that, that is actually going to um, uh, be able to direct us into uh, these uh, new pathways, uh, these new practices. We want a king. We want a king just like every other nation has. And uh, we're tired of the old traditions and the old customs and all of that. We want some newfound blood. And so uh, they told Samuel, uh, your, your age has caught up with you, um, and we don't want your sons. And I'm not, uh, Samuel had two sons, but uh, as they became appointed as leaders in his administration, they also showed that association begets assimilation because they began to adopt the practices of the rulers that they had been had become uh, influenced by. So they began to like be manipulative. They began to like uh, harbor the wealth from themselves. Uh, they began to uh, uh, create uh, different ploys uh, that would benefit themselves. Uh, they, they sought out uh, to take uh, military actions uh, that, would, that would not benefit the nation as a whole, but territories that, that they would be able to set up as their own areas of accomplishments. And so the people said, we don't want you and we don't want your sons. What we want is a king. We want a king appointed over us. And so as we look into uh, our lesson, we, we find uh, this, and I thought that this definitely is worthy of repeating, but uh, in our commentary, uh, it says at the end of our first section, uh, it reads, casual association with secular society and other religious entities has influenced worship, doctrinal principles, procedures, and standards for moral behavior and biblical discipline. Any variance from God's word is an actual reject, rejection of his rule to be like those around us. We often speak of being sanctified, of being set apart, of being different than the world, as being salt and light. Uh, but if we begin to mimic the same standards, the same moral behavior, the same doctrine, the same religious practices, we pick up, we negate principles that once governed us, and now we accept new standards and, and new ideologies about what the purpose and function of life really is. We begin to stray away, and this was the issue in Samuel with Israel, is, is that they begin to stray away from the examples that God had already set before them. It talked about how that God had already uh, relieved them and delivered them from 
the adversities and tribulations that they had faced. But because of the influence and affiliation of the same people who had oppressed them, these were not strangers that they had never had any contact with. But these are the same people who oppressed them. Now they want to become like their oppressors. They want to be governed by the same strict guidelines and cruel laws that were set up to oppress them. Now they want to mimic those laws. Now they want to actually establish and enforce those. They want to adopt the same practices that cause them so much adversity and trials and tribulations. So many times uh, uh, I remember uh, years back when we were coming up, uh, your parents would uh, look at the house and the family that was present and they would become familiarized with that, with those parents and that household. And they would say, no, 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 no. Uh, you can't go play with Timmy. Uh, not until I meet Timmy's parents. And, uh, once I meet his parents or once I meet, uh, the young lady's parents, then, after I've been introduced to the parents and I gain an understanding of their character and what goes on in their house, well, then you might be able to go to her house and spend the night. Well, then you might be able to go over to his house and you all can play games with each other. But first, I have to see what's going on in that house. Because it's my responsibility as your parent to make sure that you're not exposed to things that would bring harm to you. Things that uh, you might be exposed to that you're not able to understand or even able uh, to govern yourself against. And so uh, we later... Uh, it was referred to as peer pressure. It's like, watch who your kids are hanging out with because they can be influenced by their peers and start acting like their peers. So make sure that as parents, you, you accept the responsibility of making sure of the exposure you release your children to. So as we, as we look at this here, while they're talking about no give us a king, as a matter of fact, the second part of our lesson, biting the hand that feeds, it says Samuel summoned, uh, this is verse 17, it says Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mespah and said to them, this is what the Lord, the self-created one, the God of Israel says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God who saves you out of all the disasters and calamities. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. Now, to add to that, I want us to uh, read into the 17th chapter of Deuteronomy. Uh, the 17th chapter of Deuteronomy. And I want to uh, just lift a, a couple of insights. Now, Deuteronomy, the authorship goes to Moses. 
And the timing is about uh, 1450 to 1410 B.C. When we get to 1 Samuel, the writing or the dating on the writing now is about 1000 B.C. And so uh, we're about 440 years in between here. But I want us to look at the wisdom that's ex expressed here by Moses in Deuteronomy. I, I want us to, uh, because, you know, uh, Samuel, he, uh, the charges brought against Samuel was because he was old and, and he was aging and he was out of step. And out of time with the day, with the present day and, and the surroundings. But listen to what Moses says since they were asking for a king. Maybe if they had followed these guidelines, it may not have been as bad as it turned out to be. But, but look at what, what it says in Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter and the 14th verse. And it says, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren. You shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Now, in Egypt, wealth, large herds of cattle, horses, cows, oxen, sheep, wealth, and the accumulation thereof made Egypt appear to be wealthy and rich. But at the same time, her wealth and her richness did not spill over into her understanding of being blessed and favored on one hand, but then being inhumane and destructive on the other. So what Moses was saying was when you go, and then decide that you want to set a king over you, don't set a king over yourselves who then also loses sight of serving all of the citizenry of the nation, but wants to harbor the wealth for a elected and privileged class of the nation. So he says, don't let, don't return back to this, uh, the 10 wealthy percent of the nation. Uh, don't pick a king who's allowed to just multiply his wealth and while others are devastated and suffering, but we keep, we keep uh, publicizing how many horses the king has. So he said, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver or gold for himself. These are things to consider when you're selecting a king to rule over you. Then it says, and it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write 
for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priest, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words of the law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may uh, prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So as we are uh, seeking, as it is in the lesson, seeking a king, by what are the guidelines that the selection process is made? Our last part of our section speaks about looks are deceiving. And uh, verses 19 through 24, and it talks about how they were uh, commanded to bring all of the tribes, all of the clans together. All of the tribes came forward, and um, they cast lots like they brought forth uh, the, uh, from their territories the members of those lots, those areas. And out of them, the tribe of Benjamin was selected. And we know the story that Saul was selected as the king, uh, chosen by God. But look at the process of how it was done. Uh, when the those had gathered, uh, Samuel recognized that, no, the one that the Lord has chose still is not present. So in the 22nd verse, it says, So they inquired further of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, Yes, but he's hidden himself among the supplies. So they ran and brought him out, and he stood among the people, and he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man that the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Then the people shouted, Long live the king. And it almost uh, is ironic, but even in uh, our present dwelling, in our present day and time, a person of tall structure, height, a lot of times is, uh, shall we say, more acceptable to the people as a whole, uh, we, we have a cliche we attach to people of lower stature. Uh, and we say that they have the short man syndrome. So being tall in stature is something that is received and accepted more by the masses of people. And so when we look here and Samuel presents him, we find that one of the things he acknowledges, which makes him a little bit more receptive, is look at his statue. He's a tall man. He stands above all of those that are present. And uh, that was somewhat um, uh, received as the people responded and said, long live the king. Because we judged on the outer character of the individual. And because the outer 
expression because the outer appearance of the individual seem to tower above that of others. It was perceived as though this means that maybe the individual will be tall in statue in principles and morals and in the effect of issuing law. But we often say, do not judge a book by its cover. Don't look at the outer individual, but we have to spiritually discern the inside of the individual. And I would like to close with this because so many times we get caught up into what everybody else is doing. Well, everybody else is doing this, so it must be okay. Well, everybody else does that, and it looks like they're doing okay by it. But here is what Christ said to us in the seventh chapter of Matthew. And I close with these words. The seventh chapter of Matthew, beginning at the 13th verse. And it says, Enter. By the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few. Who find it. May God continue to add his richest blessings to the readers, to the hearers, and most certainly to the doers of his word. And our prayer is that the blessings of God will always be upon us. We always ask it in the name of Christ, and for his sake we ask it. Amen. And God bless you.